The Chicago Blackhawks claw their way back from a 4-0 deficit to pick up their biggest comeback victory in over a decade. And on today's episode, I'll talk about how they made it happen and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everyone? Welcome on into another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman, too. And make sure to also go and follow my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey, so that way you can get all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And a quick reminder, if you're watching this on YouTube right now, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff really does help me grow the show tremendously. If you're tuning into the audio version of today's show, make sure you're downloading all of those latest episodes. And even if you are someone one who regularly is watching on YouTube, please make sure to go and follow the show for 100% free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you may be listening to your podcast. Go and rate and review if you want to as well. Those are always great. And I got to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Make sure to go and download the Game Time app right now. And when you do, use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps to get $20 off to sporting events, concerts, or theater events near you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. What a freaking crazy game that occurred in San Jose on Saturday night as the Blackhawks wrapped up their three-game West Coast road trip with the final meeting of the season against the Sharks, the team there, of course, duking it out with at the bottom of the NHL standings right now. And coming into this game, the Blackhawks were... Coming off of two pretty embarrassing losses, falling, you know, uh, losing another lopsided affair to the Los Angeles Kings, a team that's righted the ship here in the past month or so and is fighting for playoff contention. No harm, no foul. Those things will happen to the Blackhawks playing against a much higher quality opponent. But to lose the way that they did in the fashion that they did against the Anaheim Ducks earlier on in the week, falling four to nothing. Second time that the Hawks were shut out in six days, 11th time that they were blanked uh, on the season. And oh yeah, it was also Lucas Dostal's first ever NHL shutout. Wasn't a very good look for the Blackhawks, that's for sure. But I figured this opportunity to play San Jose to wrap up the West Coast road trip against them, considering how they had handled them in the first two meetings of the season, I thought it was going to be a pretty good spot for the Blackhawks to take out some of their recent frustrations. But uh, no, that is not what happened early on in this game. Per usual, like we've seen basically all of March, maybe all of February, maybe all year, Blackhawks didn't come ready to play out of the gate. The first period was not very good. San Jose Sharks were taking it to them, and this is the post-deadline San Jose Sharks we're talking about. It's never a good look. Thomas Bordalo scores a pair of goals to put the Sharks ahead 2 to nothing after 20 minutes, but that's okay. We have seen the Blackhawks fight their way back after dreadful first periods time and time again here so far this month. But uh, yeah, that's not what happened out of the gate in the second period. And they actually dug themselves an even larger hole as Fabian Zetterland this time scored a pair of goals in just under a minute's time. And boom, bam, just like that, less than two minutes into the second period, the Chicago Blackhawks were trailing the San Jose Sharks for nothing. And I'm going, there's like three or four amazing college basketball games on. It's 1030 at night here in the Chicagoland area. Am, am I really going to watch the Chicago Blackhawks play the San Jose Sharks for the rest of this game with the performance they're having right now? But boy, was I glad that I did. And everyone who gutted it out the rest of the way, who is also tuning into this bottom feeder of a matchup, uh, you got rewarded as well for staying tuned in because despite looking absolutely lost for those first 25 minutes, the Hawks found a way to storm back for their biggest comeback victory in over a decade. And I have to give a huge shout out right off the rip to Ryan Donato, who's been a great energy guy here in the last couple of weeks. He really was the one who got all of this started with his hard work, 
his energy. Uh, and it felt like the Blackhawks were able to feed off of that a little bit the rest of the way. And I also got to give a shout out to uh, Taylor Radish, believe it or not, had his first multi-point game in forever. And Tyler Johnson, Luke Richardson, kind of had to hit the blender in the middle of this game with how putrid the start was for the Hawks. Uh, but that Donato Johnson radish line really calmed things down and got the Blackhawks back into this game in the second period. But it really started with Ryan Donato. Great hustle play uh, to jump on a Taylor Radish rebound and knock home the loose puck to stop the bleeding and get the Blackhawks on the board. And then just a couple of minutes later, Donato again with some great work behind the Sharks net. He draws a penalty. The extra attacker comes out for the Hawks. And then he makes a beautiful centering feed to find Tyler Johnson out in front. And that cut the Blackhawks deficit to half going into the third period. And that's really when the magic happened, folks. Seth Jones cuts the Sharks' lead to just one goal early on in the third, but it still came down to the final seconds. The Blackhawks trailed by a goal with under a minute to go. They had to get Peter Morazic out there for the extra attacker. And Philip Kurashev, baby, Johnny on the spot, pokes home the loose puck to tie the game 4-4 four to four with just 47 seconds left in regulation. The third extra attacker, 6-on-5 goal in this game for the Blackhawks. They managed to force this one into overtime, and based on how the game had ended, the Hawks had all the momentum. The Sharks were down in the dumps. I was pretty confident that the Blackhawks were going to get the job done in the three-on-three -three period, and it didn't take them very long to do so. Just 18 seconds in, Seth Jones rips home his second goal of the game for the game winner, and the Blackhawks, in comeback fashion once again, the comeback Hawks. Common theme here in the month of March, claw their way back from down four to nothing early on in the second period and wind up winning this one five to four in overtime to sweep the season series against the San Jose Sharks. Man, a crazy turn of events in this game. We got to see the worst of both of these teams. The putrid start from the Blackhawks followed up by a putrid finish by the San Jose Sharks. It was pretty comical and by the end of it, I was actually pretty glad that I stayed up for the entirety of this game. I couldn't believe the Blackhawks came back, as I said, their biggest comeback victory in over a decade. And there were a lot of takeaways that I had from this one. Um, but I thought Ryan Donato, I actually posted on X based on the uh, player performance cards that come out following every game. I called it the Ryan Donato game because he was the one who really got this started. But Seth Jones was really the one who ended it and has put together a really good run here as of late. Jones tallied his fifth and sixth goals of the season in this one and now has five goals in the last nine games. And he's recorded at least four shots on goal in six of those nine games. So I've talked about it a lot here on the podcast. I think the biggest change is just the noticeable difference in mentality for Seth Jones and a lot of other Blackhawks players. It's been a focal point for them to get the puck on net more frequently. Seth Jones has done an excellent job at that. He didn't score his first goal of the season until his 31st game, and now double digits, it's unlikely, but with the way that he's going, it's certainly not out of reach. And to have an eight or nine goal season uh, based on – or after how how things started for Seth Jones, uh, he's finished things really solidly and has been awesome on that top defensive pairing with Alex Vlasic. Excited to see those two, likely as a pairing of the future for the Blackhawks moving forward. Also got to give a shout out to Lucas Reichel. He didn't wind up with any points in this five-goal outing from the Hawks, but was noticeable all night long. It was undoubtedly his best performance since getting recalled from the Rockford Ice Hogs. And that's because the speed was so evident in not only the offensive zone, but in all three zones, like doing a great job using his wheels to impact plays on the back check, on the four check. Uh, he was forcing turnovers, making a lot of good feeds through the cent uh, through the neutral zone, going, going from defense into offense. He was very, very present, and um, if he keeps that up, man, that that's that's exactly what we need to see out of Lucas Reichel. And the consistency, the work ethic, the energy, it's been there in every game since coming back up from the Ice Hog. So um, love to see that out of Lucas Reichel. And if he continues to have those type of efforts and continues to impact the game in those ways, uh, like he did against San Jose, the points are going to come eventually. So really, really impressed with what I saw out of Lucas Reichel on Saturday night. Quite honestly, it was maybe his best game of the entire season, even though he didn't record a point. A guy who did record a couple of points in this one, though, to stay red hot 
is Philip Kurashev, baby. Wound up with an assist on um, the game tie, or obviously wound up with the uh, assist on Seth Jones' game winner, was the one to tie the game late in the third period to force overtime. Two more points now gives him 46 in 64 games on the season. Just incredible stuff out of Philip Kurashev. 14 points shy of the 60 point plateau. I know that's probably going to be out of reach with. Uh, 11 games left on the schedule, but 14 points in 11 games, the way that he's been rolling, the way that he and Bedard have been able to establish chemistry with one another. I don't know. I don't think it's impossible for Philip Kershev, but whether it's 52 points, 55 points, or even 60 points, still just an offensive explosion of a season out of Philip Kershev that I really didn't think he had in his arsenal. So he continues to just be great night in and night out. Really, there haven't been... Um, underwhelming performances in bunches out of Philip Kershev this year. And that was really the biggest knock that I had on him was he was showing flashes. He just hadn't put it together consistently. Well, he's done exactly that and made the most of his opportunity with Connor Bedard this season. Wyatt Kaiser, also another good youngster who I thought was uh, kind of quietly excellent in this game, other than the late penalty that he took in the third period almost cost the Hawks their comeback chances. But other than that, just thought he played a simple game, used his speed and wheels to get out of harm's way. He keeps doing that. Uh, he, he's going to end this season on a very high note and give himself a good chance to be a regular in the lineup for the Blackhawks again to kick off next season. The only downfall of winning this game and sweeping the series uh, season series against the Sharks, folks, is, of course, it might be the nail in the coffin for San Jose uh, to finish last in the standings because the Hawks are now five points ahead of the Sharks. And, of course, San Jose does hold the tiebreaker because of the season sweep. The Hawks have 11 games left on their schedule. The Sharks have 12. And, you know, considering all the moves that San Jose made at the deadline, I really don't envision them winning four or five more times in their final 12 contests of the season. And even then, the Blackhawks would, like, have to lose out. So I think this – might have sealed the deal. San Jose very likely is going to finish last in the NHL standings. But as I've said time and time again, it's all going to come down to the lottery. Regardless, it worked out very well for the Blackhawks last year. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that that happens exactly again for the second consecutive season. But there are my thoughts on the Hawks. Huge comeback win over San Jose on Saturday night. Coming up in just a moment here, Blackhawks fans, I'll be getting into part three of the 2024 NHL draft rankings based on uh, the consensus from four of the top draft analysts in the game. But first, I got to talk to you all about game time. You shouldn't have to stress or worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event, and that's why game time is the perfect place for you to go for all of your tickets. It's the fastest, the easiest, and the cheapest way for you to purchase tickets, whether you're going to a sporting event, a concert, a theater event, whatever it may be near you always go and check out game time. I've personally used it since I was back in high school when I'd go down to the United Center to go see the Blackhawks in their heyday, or uh, even if I'm going down to Wrigley Field to go and check out the Cubs during the summer, or if I'm traveling in another city and want to go and see a concert or want to go and see a comedy show with one of my friends. I actually used game time when I was in Las Vegas back in September. It's always my go-to place for tickets because they're the cheapest, the fastest, and the easiest way for you to get them. Plus, I love how they show seats uh, from every ticket before you purchase them. So you know exactly what to expect before your purchase or upon arrival. I highly recommend you all go and download the Game Time app right now. And when you do, make sure to create an account and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL in all caps for $20 off with your first purchase. Yes, you heard me right. You can get $20 off to come and see Connor Bedard play at the United Center this season. All you have to do is download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code LOCKDOWNNHL. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed, Game Time. Segment two, in the last episode that came out on Friday, I got into part two of the 2024 NHL draft rankings according to four of the top draft analysts and scouts in the game and Chris Peters, Scott Wheeler, Bob McKenzie, and Corey Pronman. And on Friday, I broke down numbers 11 through 20 on their consensus that on their consensus list after getting into the top 10 a few weeks ago. And if you haven't checked out those episodes already, you can easily find them in the 
2024 NHL draft playlist on the Lockdown Blackhawks YouTube page. Make sure to go and hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so already, but make sure to go and check out those episodes to hear who these draft analysts have going in the top 10 as of right now or who they have ranked in numbers 11 through 20. And of course, today I'm going to be getting into numbers 20 through 32 to round out the first round. And then once I do, I'm going to be getting into some more draft profiles. Yes, I am going to be having mock drafts coming out here soon as we're starting to creep towards the summer. The 2024 NHL draft is not all that far away. And for the best Blackhawks coverage leading up to the draft, make sure that you're subscribed to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. Don't want to miss out on any of the good stuff that I'm going to be getting into over the next couple of months. Multiple good guests, mock drafts, breakdowns, crossovers with some of the other hosts of bottom feeder teams across the NHL. It's going to be a lot of fun here over the next couple of months, folks. A lot more fun than it's been watching the Blackhawks throughout this regular season. But getting into numbers 21 through 32. Number 21 here is Aaron Kivy Haryu, a 5 foot 11 165 pound left-handed defenseman turned 18 back in January but unfortunately has missed most of his draft eligible season due to injury but he did tally two points in seven Liga games to open up the season playing professional hockey already at a young age and he also played in 21 Liga games as a 17 year old last year tallying three assists in those 21 games and added seven assists as well in seven games at the U18 World Juniors so kind of like Adam Yurchek it's going to be really interesting Interesting to see how these teams value a defenseman like Aaron Kiviharyu, uh, even though he didn't get to play most of his draft eligible season. Is that going to hurt his stock at all once we get into the 20s? It's going to be rather interesting. Uh, next up at number 22 is Bennett Seneca. Se- Seneca. Yeah, Bre- yeah, I've had trouble pronouncing his last name. I actually wrote it down because it looks like it could be Seneca, Senec- Seneca, Bennett. Seneca, six foot two, 185 pound winger, uh, played his um, minor hockey with the uh, Toronto Marlboros and is now playing for the Oshawa Generals in the OHL. This year, he's tallied 68 points in 63 OHL games, 27 goals and 41 assists, and was nearly a point per game player last year for the Generals as well. And then at number 23 is Michael Hage, a six foot one, 190 pound center. He turns 18 in April, and he's actually playing in the USHL nearby here in Chicago for the Chicago Steel. His first full season there has gone very successfully. He's got 68 points, 31 goals and 37 assists in those 50 games. And he's also going to be attending the university of Michigan next year. So, Hey, I I certainly wouldn't rule out the Blackhawks having high interest in a player like Michael Hage because they're very familiar with the Chicago steel organization and a collegiate program uh, that he'll be attending next year in Michigan as well. So Michael Hage could be someone to uh, keep an asterisk next to, and don't forget the Blackhawks of course have a second first round selection on behalf of the Tampa Bay Lightning stemming from that Brandon Hagel deal. So there is good reason to be diving into all of these prospects a little bit more heavily than normal in this year's draft. And number 24 is Charlie Elick, six foot three, 200 pound, 200 pound, big right-handed defenseman turned 18 years old back in January. He's currently playing for the Brandon Wheat Kings in the WHL and has tallied 27 points four goals and 23 assists in 67 WHL games. Not really known as an offensive defenseman, but has very good size for an 18 year old already 200 pounds could give him room to be well above that uh, in a few years down the road. And he has showed some offensive improvements, even though the numbers don't jump off the charts at you, considering he tallied just 11 points in 56 OHL games the year before. And number 25 is Tanner House, 5 foot 11, 180 pound forward who turned 18 back in November. He is another interesting prospect to keep in mind, Blackhawks fans, because he is now the captain of the Regina Pats, filling in the shoes after Connor Bedard last year 
He's done that really well. He's got 77 points, 28 goals, and 49 assists in 68 games this year as their captain. And he was producing last year along with Connor Bedard, had 85 points in 67 games. And he's now been a point-per-game player uh, in the WHL in three consecutive seasons. And I'm sure the Blackhawks have gotten a lot of good footage on Tanner Howe based on how much they were scouting Bedard last year. And they'll likely be getting some good input from Connor. You know, maybe he's not going to be dictating whether or not the Blackhawks take him, but a good guy to ask, you know, how's Tanner Howe in the locker room? What kind of player is he? They'll have a lot of good insight on Tanner Howe, so I'm really curious uh, about him in the late 20s for the Blackhawks as well. Coming in at number six, uh, 26 is Tariq Parasak, 5'11", 180-pound winger who has been excellent for the Prince George Cougars in the WHL this season. Still only 17 years old, a rookie in the WHL, doesn't turn 18 until late May. He's got 105 points in 68 games for the Cougars in his first full WHL season. 43 goals and 62 assists in 68 games. Parasak wasn't really someone who was high on the radar going into this year, but boy, has he burst onto the scene. Could be going even earlier than number 26, in my opinion here, based on the type of year that he's had. Guy coming in at number 27, I think is super interesting as well. Ryder Ritchie, who's a six foot, 175 pound forward, but he's one of the youngest players in this year's draft as he doesn't turn 18 years old until August. And so far in the WHL, he's nearly been a point-per-game player. 44 points, 19 goals, and 25 assists in 47 games at 17 years of age. And he also tallied 55 points in 61 games as a 16-year-old last year in the WHL. So some pretty impressive numbers at a young age for Ryder Ritchie, who comes in at number 27. At number 28 is Nikita Artamanov, a 5'11", 190-pound winger who turned 18 back in November. So there's basically almost a year's age difference between Artemanov and Ryder Ritchie or Tariq Parasak, um, which is always pretty interesting and something to consider when going into the draft. But Artemanov, 5'11", 190-pound winger, like I said, another Russian prospect who's already playing um, big-time hockey at a young age, 23 points in 54 KHL games this season. Nothing to bat an eye at for Nico uh, Nikita Artemanov. The question is with those Russians. He is signed on with uh, Torpedo. Uh, oh my gosh, I forget the rest of the it's Regardless, he is signed on through the end of next season. Whenever he does come over to North America, those are always those questions, but some pretty respectable numbers in what's considered to be the second best professional league in all of hockey. And number 29 is Henry Muse, a six foot, 185 pound right handed defenseman who turned 18 a couple of weeks ago here in the month of March. He's tallied 61 points in 65 OHL games for the Ottawa 67s from the blue line this year, 15 goals and 46 assists, and also had 31 points in 55 WHL games the year, or OHL games, excuse me, the year prior. Coming in at number 30, Cole Hudson, another one of the Hudson brothers at 5'10", only 160 pounds. Like uh, his older brother, he's going to have to certainly grow into his frame to succeed at the next level. But I got to give him a shout out. He's from Barrington and like his older brother also is going to be attending uh, Boston University once he wraps up this season with the United States National Team Development Program. And for them, he's tallied 38 points, 11 goals and 27 assists in 43 games. Uh, good skating, offensive minded defenseman. Going to be interesting to see if Cole Hudson winds up going in the first round. And number 31 is Andrew Basha, six foot, 185 pound forward, who also turned 18 back in November. Putting up some really good numbers, though, offensively for the Medicine Hat Tigers. 85 points, 30 goals, and 55 assists in just 63 games this year. And is coming off of a near point per game campaign last year, where he tallied 56 points in 67 games. And then wrapping things up for the first round, coming in at number 32 is Leo Salin Valenius, who I low-key am not familiar with whatsoever. I've at least heard of most of these guys before. Leo, I'm not all that familiar with, but he's a six foot, 175 pound left-handed defenseman. And hey, that's the fun of this segment. If 
you're not familiar with some of these prospects as well, we're going to learn more about them together. And that's going to be the fun part about going into all of these individual players' draft profiles as we get to focus on them solely for a 15 or 20 minute segment. And then we kind of dictate as to where I think they're going to go in the draft, whether or not I believe the Blackhawks should take a chance on them. That's the whole fun of it. But for Leo Salin Valenius, uh, six foot, 175 pound left handed defenseman, turns 18 next month in April, playing in the J20 National League over in Sweden. Not professional, but uh, putting up some really respectable numbers for. Uh, only being 17 years old is playing in a J20 league. He's got 42 points, 11 goals, and 31 assists in 43 games this season. So that round things out for the first round. There's the list of prospects ranked inside the top 32, according to Corey Pronman, Bob McKenzie, Scott Wheeler, and Chris Peters. Coming up in just a moment here, I still have to get into our weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment, where I answer a question from a couple of lucky listeners right here on the Lockdown Blackhawk. Podcast. But first, I got to talk to you all about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience is what brings home the winning trophy, and it's also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and to level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. Plus, with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or else you'll get your money back. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. With all the parts you need at the prices you actually want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and to bring home that win. Again, that's ebaymotors.com. Back here on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Again, just a reminder to smash that like button, comment down below, subscribe to the Lockdown Blackhawks YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. And also, make sure to go and check out the new Lockdown Sports today because Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And Lockdown has got you covered with the biggest sports stories of the day plus our national shows covering every single league. So make sure to go and check out Lockdown Sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. All right, segment three. Of course, it's that time once again to get into our weekly Mailbag Monday fan segment. And just a reminder if you have a question that you want answered on the show this time next week, make sure to go and drop that in the comment section right now. Or you can even DM me on any one of my social media accounts, email lockdownblackhawks at gmail.com. There are so many ways that you can reach out and get your question to me so that I can answer it right here live on the show. And it really is one of my favorite segments that I do regularly. And I would love to even have this turn into an entire Monday episode. But the only way that's possible is if all you watching right now, go and reach out with your questions in the comment section or slide into my DMs. Please help me help you. Let's make this thing a little bit more interesting. I do got a slew of good questions today, but I would love to turn Mailbag Monday into an entire episode. But without any further ado, first question that I wanted to get into here today comes from the real me 2727 on X who asked, been an ugly season altogether. Honest question. How much more rope does Richardson get? All of next season? More? Less? 320 win percentage is pretty horrid. And I think this is a really good question. The reason why I wanted to start off with it is it's a question that I honestly get pretty often because, yeah, you go and look at Luke Rich <clears throat> excuse me, you go and look at Luke Richardson's record as the head coach of the Blackhawks. And yeah, it certainly has not been pretty, but there's a lot of factors that go into that. Last season, the Blackhawks were expecting to be horrid. This year, yeah, we expected things to be a little bit better, but I still envision this team being uh, bottom 10 in the entire league. But due to injuries, it wound up being even worse than they expected. But there is going to be a time where Luke Richardson is going to have to prove himself worthy of being the head coach of the Chicago Blackhawks, not just in their rebuilding stage, when it's actually time to go and win things. I just don't think you can really pile up on him and call him a bad coach right now because we just really don't know. But I do think after the conclusion of this year, the start of next season, I really believe this Blackhawks organization 
I don't think they're going to be trying to contend for the playoffs. I think that's uh, a little bit too big of a leap, but they, they certainly want to be better than they were this year. They know they're really pushing the fan base, fan bases limits. Um, and I think they just, it's that time to start building that winning culture in the locker room. I'm not saying again, they're going to go and make the playoffs, but they want to be winning more games than they have the last couple of years. That's for sure. And I think if, Next year is another underwhelming season for Luke Richardson. I think then some questions are are really starting to be asked in this organization. But even then, I don't know if like a, another lackluster season would be the end of the job for Luke Richardson because he's a very respected guy. The players respect him. The Blackhawks usually do fight hard. Like I know they have stinkers, but it's not downright lopsided night in and night out. The players play hard. They're just under talented. The Blackhawks just don't have a lot of talent. And until they get more talent, it's going to be hard to dictate whether or not Luke Richardson is the coach of the future. But like I said, if the Blackhawks underwhelm again next year, uh, I do think then it would be time for him to be put on the hot seat. It's still too early for that though, right here, right now. Next question uh, comes from at Ken Bridgman on X who asked, if we sent Arvid Soderbloom down, would he have to clear waivers? I actually meant to go and look this up beforehand. I believe he is waiver exempt. I believe he is. But honestly, it it might not even matter. If Arvid Soderbloom isn't waivers exempt and the Blackhawks would have to send him down, I quite honestly don't know right here, right now, that another NHL team would claim him. Um, But regardless, it is kind of a mute point because the Blackhawks aren't going to be sending Arvid Soderbloom down this season. They're not going to be calling up Jackson Stauber or Drew Comesso this year. But there are a boatload of questions to to be answered this offseason in terms of what the Blackhawks are going to do in net other than Peter Morazic. Is it going to be Arvid Soderbloom given a chance to be the backup? Are they going to bring in a veteran to compete with him? Are they going to just give him another opportunity elsewhere. Are are they going to be re-signing Jackson Stauber and let him duke it out with Soderbloom for the backup job in the NHL level? And if Stauber wins, then you can still send Soderbloom down to Rockford with a year left on his contract. There's a lot that goes into it, right? Um, So it really doesn't, sorry, kind of really doesn't matter if he's going on, if he's waivers eligible right here, right now, because it's not happening the rest of the year. But it is a question that will become more important at training camp time in the fall. Next question comes from old sneaky Pete who asks, think the Hawks signed Bassey had a good season at St. Cloud, big frame. A lot of people just love Dominic Bassey. I probably didn't help in that because he had just such a fantastic junior season last year. I was really excited. He had a 230 goals against average and a 911 save percentage after transferring from Colorado college in his first year with St. Cloud state. It's been a struggle for Dominic Bassey the last month or so. He wasn't even the starter for St. Cloud in their big games in the NCHC conference tournament. And I don't think he's going to be starting for them in the NCAA tournament either because his numbers have just dropped heavily. A 10, uh, 12, 10 and two record this year. Yeah, that's okay. But two, seven, five goals against average is way up. Eight ninety six way for save percentage is way down. Uh, and they arguably have a better team in front of them than they did last year. So there are some concerns about Bassey. I still would be willing to give him an AHL deal and let him try to prove himself, at least in Rockford or in Indy. Going to be interesting to see if the Blackhawks feel the same way. Next t- question comes from at 12 year Lagavulin on X, who asked impressive comeback versus San Jose on Saturday, but will it cost you a chance at Celebrini? It's going to be up to the draft lottery. Um, It could. It could. And yes, that would absolutely suck, right? I would hate to see uh, Macklin Celebrini go anywhere besides the Chicago Blackhawks. But how can you expect to lose as much as San Jose does with the roster that they have after the trade deadline in the Blackhawks schedule in March? I've said it for the last couple of weeks, maybe even a month now. It was going to be really tough for the Blackhawks to uh, lose more than the San Jose Sharks down the stretch of the season. Next question comes from, last question actually, comes from at Bowling Twig one on X who asked, do you think Paul Ludwinski heads to Rockford after the season? And again, make sure if you have a question right here, right now, if you're still watching, if you're still listening to this point in today's show, go and reach out with your question. I want to answer them here live on the show. I greatly appreciate you. 
Yeah, I think it probably is time for Paul Ludwinski to make the jump to the professional level. He's been excellent as the captain of the Kingston Frontenacs again this season. Really, really taken his offensive game to another level. 69 points in 60 games this year. 23 goals and 46 assists in his third OHL season. He only had 34 points in 47 games last year. And out of those 34 points, only nine of them were goals. So the goal scoring has gone up. The playmaking has gone up. I think he's gotten more to tenacious out there. The speed looks better whenever I see him in the playmaking. Well, it is at the junior hockey level. It's better than what it was a year ago. And I think because of those upticks in those areas and the, the size that he has, the energy that he provides, Paul Ludwinski could be a lot of different things down the road for the Blackhawks. I hope he winds up being a good player, but he almost feels like he has that Swiss army knife type of potential. And I really think because of that, the Blackhawks organization would like to get their hands on him as soon as possible. It's not set in stone. It's not locked in, but I personally would be a little bit shocked to not see Paul Ludwinski playing for uh, the Rockford Ice Hogs early on next season. All right, that is going to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Blackhawks. As always, thank you all again for tuning into the show. And be sure to go and subscribe to the Locked On Blackhawks podcast. And also go and follow Locked On Blackhawks for free wherever you may be listening to your podcast. And that way you can get the latest episode as soon as it becomes available each and every day. As always, I'm your boy, Jack Bushman. Do me a favor. Go and give me a follow on X at Jack Bushman too. And make sure to go and check out my strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey as well. So that way you can get all of the latest Blackhawks news and updates. So until tomorrow's episode, everyone stay safe. It looks like we got some better weather coming in the next few days. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that that's the case because seeing snow on the ground in late March is just not the move. But until the next episode, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you next time on the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.